Yeah. This um, this process that you've been describing, learning how to most effectively speak in public, um, reminds me of this quote that I wrote down, something you said. Uh, I'm going to read it to you. I want you to react. Okay. I promise that right now you are radically underestimating your capacities. Test yourself. Throw yourself out into some impossible, insane thing and see if you can fly. I had that in my show prep, but you're talking about purposely generating discomfort for yourself. We, we are so inclined to fall back into the comfortable and mm. into the routine. And we all underestimate our, our minds and our capacity. I, it's so awful. People make constant excuses for themselves. Uh, the most common which, uh, well, there's several common, common ones, but I didn't have time. Th that is the biggest bullshit excuse anybody ever says. I mean, anybody who says that, should, you should just wipe that phrase out of your, out of your vocabulary. Listen, listen to what you're saying. You're saying, I didn't have time. That means you perfectly allocated your time to all the things you had to do, and you can't have reshuffled anything. You couldn't have done things more efficiently, more efficiently. Uh, that, I think it's just nonsense. Can I you think, I'm curious. Can you think of an example where somebody said, I didn't have time, what it, what it was and why you thought that was well, it's bullshit? Almost, it's almost always something that they didn't really want to do. I mean, that's why we use that phrase. And then you have to ask yourself, well, why didn't I want to do it? Maybe I need to change the nature of the task. You know, maybe I need to gamify it, you know, uh, need to do something to it so that suddenly I do have the time. The, another one that, I, that, that, uh, that you hear is people say, I'm tired. I'm just tired. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm not saying that people never get tired. Yes, people get tired. But we are so inclined to want to jump to that excuse all the time. And the more you say I'm tired, the more tired you are. And it's and it's just it's just it's just nonsense, really. You're not really tired. You just don't want to do the thing that you've been called upon to do. What I like to do is do the hard things first and and then you feel that sense of satisfaction and get that adrenaline rush that comes from having completed something. Mm -hmm. And then and that's what inspires you. People can get feel tired because quite often we just psychologically know there's something we're supposed to be doing that we don't really want to do. And so we put it off with procrastinate as much as possible. And that's like mentally exhausting to us. So these are the kinds of tricks that you have to uh Engage in another thing that that makes people feel like I'm out of time. I'm tired. I can't do that. Is that we too often do things that we wish we hadn't done? You know, uh, overeat, fail to exercise this morning. Um, th there's a lot of things we do in our lives that are just sort of bad for us, but we persist in doing them. So I think part of generating a hopeful sense of creativity and being more productive is to uh, is to is, is to live better lives essentially um, get more disciplined about what it is we want to accomplish and connect our long-term goals with our short-term behaviors you know that's, sure. that's really important whether it's lose you know you want to lose weight over the long term then don't eat that tub of ice cream now I mean but it's funny our minds are funny we we can continue to sustain a long-term goal even though the steps that are required to get there are not being taken in the present. You know, we make every excuse for whatever we want to do now uh, without assessing the wisdom of what we're doing right now relative to the goal we want to accomplish. It's, it's like we have intertemporal discoordination problems between our actions and our goals. You're absolutely right. I know from experience I've had a lot of those. And I think not really having a clear mission or having a clear vision, it's it makes the doorway too wide and too open for all of these things that can come in and wind up on a person's desk that, you know, they look at and the ultimate decision is, oh, I'm too tired or I didn't have time because these things got here that they didn't want there. They're not motivated to do those things. You know, like sometimes if, if you're doing something to get somebody to leave you alone, <laughs> you know, like, hey, Brett, will you do this thing for me? Uh, and I don't want to do it. I should just ask. I should I should bring it into my organization system and say, does this in any way advance my mission? And if the right. answer is no, maybe it shouldn't wind up on my desk at all. And and maybe I think uh, it's about uh, you know being more discerning and just being able to say no, uh, no, I will not do that. 
that's, that's, a, that's a tough thing to say to people though it is and and how do you motivate yourself to say that um, one thing to think about always is the opportunity cost of what you're doing right now. Like whatever you're doing, you have to consider the thing that you've given up to do it and remember that that's the price you're paying. Mm-hmm. And so it's a matter of economic logic, you know, and, and this is why studying economics is a good thing. Uh, so you're always aware of the, of the price you're paying for whatever, whatever your actions uh, you're doing. There's, there's a, the life is full of trade-offs. And, and we're always trading one thing for another, one task for another task. What you're doing now, you're trading in for everything. You're declining to do all the things you otherwise would be doing. And to just begin to think like that is a great way to motivate you to say no and to stay on task and, and, and start living in a more productive life. And I think being productive, Brett, is the, is the key to sort of self-esteem and actually happiness itself. I, I've, I've always believed this. This is why people get so depressed on holidays, um, you know, like Christmas mm-hmm. um, or vacation times or whatever, um, because they feel like they're not actually accomplishing anything and their, their, their patterns of productivity are disrupted and it sends us into sta- tailspins of despair. Or here's another thing, uh, whenever you get sick, and you're like physically unable to do the thing you want to do, you'll notice that comes with a kind of a sadness. Mm, sure. Like when people are sick, they're sad. And it's not that they're just sad that they're sick. They're sad that they're not productive, you know, and those things come together. And you can go into tailspins of despair. And I remember the first time I realized that I was sick one time and I was sad. Then I realized, oh, why am I sad? Well, it's because I'm not doing anything but being sick. So what it means is that my sadness is illusory in a way. I'm not physically capable right now or mentally capable of doing something, but this will pass and, and I'll get better and then I'll be able to work again. And, the, and just knowing that made me happier. <laughs> mm. do, you think, do you think that especially young people, but a lot of people aren't productive in creative ways because they don't think they can be? And do you think they can be? A question that I posed in a recent show on the same topic to uh, Julia Tryanskia was, does everybody have a creative capacity? Now, we spent time talking about her experiences in art school and how people were just kind of patted on the head for, you know, in her opinion, low quality work. And I think there's plenty of that in in higher education. Um but her assessment was that, no, maybe not everybody can do really powerful, meaningful, creative work. What do you think about that question? Uh, I think everybody can get better. I think that's, that's really the main thing. And I, 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 I have to I spend a lot of my professional life actually managing people. Mm-hmm. Um, and to be in a, to be in a, in a position of a kind of leadership or management, you gradually come to understand that unless the people you're working with feel a sense of empowerment and I hate the word ownership uh, over your job because you can't buy and sell it but you know what I mean it's a metaphor unless they have some sense of owning their job or or that somebody around them expects uh, uh, that person to achieve excellence and be creative about it they will not be that way you can't just give orders to people it's not just you know this is why totalitarianism doesn't work but it's also why bad managers fail because they sit around giving orders to people rather than presenting and focusing problems and saying, you know, here's a, here's a problem we have. Um, what, do you, what do you think would be a good answer to it? You know? And then, and then and also you have to be uh, tolerant of failure and actually celebrate uh, failure and celebrate when things go wrong because that's great. You get information you didn't have before. But if you can create that kind of environment of ex- experimentation, um, uh, and you're aware of your own fallibility, and you kind of are willing to crowdsource your knowledge and test it against reality, then everybody begins to kind of have fun. And, and that's a precondition for, be, for being creative and, and feeling valuable, actually. Mm-hmm. I, this idea of, of feeling valuable, it's, I think it's the, sort of the most underestimated human emotion there is. Um, to be devalued, undervalued, or not valued at all is transformative of our hearts and our souls. And, it, and if it's never happened to you, you can't even imagine what kind of sort of uh, dark night of the soul you enter into when you're surrounded by people who don't value you, you as a human being or value your mind or have any concern for you. It's, it's, 
it's utterly devastating. I mean, the first time I ever felt that in my entire life was the first time I went to jail. Hmm. And being locked behind bars and realizing that all the people that controlled my life uh, had no regard for me whatsoever, my personality, my skills, you know, I was, I was robbed of, of everything that made me who I believed I was. Yeah, yeah. And I could continue to maybe maintain those beliefs myself, but if you're suddenly surrounded by people who are controlling you, who have no regard whatsoever. There's no you, mirror, yeah. Yeah, then uh, you can just, you, you, it, it changes everything. You suddenly realize, I'm nothing to these people other than, than uh, a, a beating heart or just a, just a bag of flesh. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Just, uh, bag of bones, really. And it, it changes your whole per- perception and, and personality and outlook on the world. And, and it can happen so fast, but it can happen within a few hours. You know, we're not talking about, oh, after 10 years in jail, he began to get depressed. No, it happens like within the first day. How old were you when this happened? Oh, God. Uh, so I think this happened about about uh, maybe 10 years ago or something. Oh, so all right. So you yeah. had a fair amount of life experience under your belt. Yeah, and it was just it was having, and, and that's what we do. Our whole lives are kind of structured this way. We want to be around people who value us. Uh, that's sort of the story of life. I mean, we, we try to we try to find ways in, in, to enhance our, our, our sense of of, uh, of being valued by other people. I mean, that's that's why we choose the partners we choose in life. It's it's why we choose uh, so many things we do. It's just because we we have an innate sense of wanting to be valued, you know, and valuable to others. To be valued and to be valuable to others. Um, I don't know, it's a self preservation instinct or whatever it is. But when suddenly that changes and you're not given that opportunity, which I'm, I'm sorry to say is basically the story of, of, of the classroom these days, and it's the story of public school, mm-hmm. um, then it changes you know, who we are. And it just doesn't matter uh, what we think about ourselves if it's not reaffirmed by anybody surrounding us and if we're not given the opportunity to serve others. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, de- it's utterly dehumanizing. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm trying to think more carefully about talking to generally about the school experience and the school to jail comparison. But while opportunities for self-expression and creativity, I think, do exist in a person's life between the ages of five and 17, uh, they are robbed of just countless hours of time where those things could be fostered it's, and, it's and a, further it's an developed. It's a world. Yeah, it's terrible. And 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 what choice do the students have except to kind of believe that maybe this is a good thing in the end? Maybe it's a good thing in the end, you know? Mm-hmm. And so they f- vaguely acquiesce. And so by the time they're 18, uh, they've come around to the view that, well, maybe the adults are right. Maybe this is what's good for me. Maybe this is is the way that I... That I um, prepare for a happy life. Yeah, you know, and I fight those negative thoughts sometimes by saying, well, no, look at all the people who actually are doing these things that they find fulfilling or that are incredibly creative or that are adding this, uh, you know, entertainment or artistic value to the world. But then, as you know from our previous conversations, there's also a very loud cynic in me that says, unfortunately, and this is like the, the realistic assessment of the, of the school system and its impact on society. That is almost nobody, you know? Like, you, you can say, oh, look at all these people who are in the movies. Look at all these people who've made it in music. Statistically speaking, that is an insignificant number of people, you know? And that, I think, is a, is a terrible tragedy. And I think that that was, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to put that earlier question to you. A lot of people have this creative potential that they've either ignored or haven't figured out well, how to unlock true. yet. It's, it's so, so tragic. Or they've not been able to unlock it in ways that are productive. Yeah. They use it in ways that are destructive of themselves person, personally and don't have a sort of forward mo- motion um, a, at all. Um, and this is the real tragedy, I think, of, of school, because it, school is just a series of shattered relationships. That's all it is. I mean, uh, kids don't throw themselves into the, into the classes or the ideas, and it's just a myth, and they've been, they had that beat out of them long ago. So they throw themselves into sort of their social networks, you know, um, finding out who they are relative to other people, developing, you know, rich, interesting relationships with people. Um, 
and then and then and then the clock runs out. You know, suddenly like, okay, you've just graduated from middle school, and now you're going to a different high school. So that friendship network network is shattered. Then they graduate from high school. It's like, oh, don't ever change. I love you. You know, whatever. And and then the the, the the very next day, suddenly they find themselves in the abyss. You know, and and it's all gone. They try to hang on for the summer, but then they're off to college or they're off to a workplace. And all these, all their friendship networks are again scattered to the winds. They have no support groups. Uh, you know, they're alone on Friday nights, so they don't know what to do. They don't know what strings to pull, who to call if they get in trouble. They're completely alone. So then they do the same thing at college, and the networks get even richer and more elaborate and and uh, uh, more robust, and they become sort of all consuming because now they're all becoming young adults. And then graduation happens, and Oh my God, now calamity begins because everybody's scattered to the winds again. You have nothing to show for all that you did. All your exercises of creativity and social organization and network building and all the things that were an extension of your human power personality are now just thrown away, uh, just trashed. And you're facing a world where everybody, all the adults seem like they're kind of getting along just fine and you experience a kind of like a deep sense of, of grotesque level of alienation, and you're faced with massive amounts of student debt, and you don't know what to do. This is the reason for the massive amount of depression that people feel in their, in their mid-20s, you know, a sense of never having grown up and having no uh, viable future, being saddled with debt, and um, also a sense of, like, for the first time, realizing that everybody lied to you your whole life. You did it right. And there's no payoff. And that's yeah. terrible. That's truly, truly terrible. So it calls upon, you know, a deep, and th that's the default, I think, for, for, uh, for millennials, actually. We were talking earlier about the song called Stressed Out. And it's a sad song in many ways because the song um, is longing for the good old days. And he says, I wish we could return to the good old days when our mamas uh, sang us to sleep because now I feel nothing but stress. And a person standing over yelling at me, wake up and make money, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a deeply sad song. Uh, I mean, to, for, for a whole generation to have that kind of reactionary attitude that I would like to return to the old, old days, that's, that's unnatural. That's, that's unhealthy. I mean, if you're 22, you should be singing more like Taylor Swift. 22, I don't know about you. That should be your song. Mm -hmm. Not wish I could return back to the good old days. Of, of security when mom took care of me when I was sick and and I wasn't uh, you know feeling uh, you know this this sort of sense of being lost and alienated with your whole life ahead of you with your whole life ahead of you and, and no sense of how to navigate it right this is why it's so often that people fail in their first jobs out of school uh, they don't do well they don't know what it means to add value to a firm they don't they they can, can take orders, but actually taking orders is not a very valuable skill in the commercial commercial marketplace. You have to be able to create value um, and, in order to uh, become valuable. Uh, you have to you have to create more value. You have to put in more value than you take out. 